Greetings today on this beautiful Easter Sunday morning. We welcome every one of you here in the auditorium in the Northside Baptist Church. We appreciate your presence. We're glad to see some visitors with us today as well as our own people. We welcome every one of you. May the Lord bless you. And then you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edwards speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up we can be a real inspiration to everyone. Now I'm sure you're going to enjoy the good singing in the direction of Brother Tony. And you in the radio listening audience, if you'd get on that phone and call a friend, and have them to tune in and get this hour, I feel we can be an inspiration to them. So you do that, you do them a favor. And we appreciate you that are here and you that's listening out the radio listening audience. Now the singing, the music, and the message will be on tape number 276. Tape number 276. I'd be glad to send you a list of our cassette tape. I can send you a list of more than 250. Plus we have 14 on the book of Ruth. I'd be glad to send you a list. You can write in and get these tape. They're $3 each. And the gift you give for the tape is used to help our defray our radio expense. And we work this together in getting out the gospel. And it's a privilege to have a part in it. I hope you realize that. Wise people have a part in the work of God, and I trust you're wise, and you'll have a part in this whole mission work. Now, my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. Now, you pray for me if you're saved, born-again believer, and if you're not saved, you need to get saved because you never know when it could be too late. Now take your Bible today and turn to Matthew chapter 28. It's page 1043 in the original Scofield Reference Bible. I'm going to speak to you today on this subject. He is not here. He is risen. You'll find that in the scripture I'll be reading in a moment. He is not here, but he is risen. Now in Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 1, and the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and set up on it. His countenance were like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Notice that, will you please? He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quick and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And the Holy Ghost before you unto Galilee, there shall you see him, lo, I have told you. They departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, the whole Jesus met them, saying, All hell, and they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Now that's as far as I'm reading this morning, I'll be giving you other verses. During the day, you ought to read this great chapter, the entire chapter, and many other scriptures that has to do uh, with the uh, resurrection. Now, the devil hates the fact that the resurrection is no doctrine in the Bible, hated any more than the doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The devil hates and despises that doctrine. In the other church, everywhere, preaching in the world today. Now, Jesus Christ is the head of the church, he's the head of true Christianity. Now there was a man by the name of Mohammedan. There was a man by the name of Buddha. There was one by the name of Confucius and others. They're dead. They're down in the bowels of the earth today. But Jesus Christ is alive and up in heaven at the right hand of God the Father and he's the only one 
that's alive today that heads up these religions, that is, the false religions. Those men died and we died without God. But Jesus Christ is very God and is now in heaven and he heads up a live religion. That is true Christianity. A few years ago, we visited the Dome of the Rock over in Israel and, and one of our men along with us on the tour as one of those Muslims said, where is Mohammedan today? Why, well, he said he's dead forevermore. Well, beloved, Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. Now, you need to realize that. And we have the live and true religion, if you want to call it that. I don't like to use the term religion because it's not used in a good sense. But I'm talking about the true kind. You know what I'm talking about. People that... Believe the Bible and the infallibility of the blessed book and believe the fundamentals of the faith and, and believe the, the Bible as it is. And that's the kind I'm talking about. Now there's prophecy pertaining to this resurrection. Now in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, Jesus gave a word, of course, which was prophecy at that time, which is history now. For as Jonah was three days and three nights, in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now Jesus said he, the Son of Man, would be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now when Jesus died on Calvary, Jesus descended down into the heart of the earth. They placed his body there in Joseph's new tomb. And for 72 hours, that body lay there in that tomb. And then after 72 hours, exactly 72 hours, three days and three nights, Jesus came back and re-entered that body. And then he came out of that grave. Now he fulfilled the prophecy that he gave in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40. He literally and minutely fulfilled it when he came back and entered that body. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21, from that day forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things to the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So Jesus fulfilled that scripture. He told them that he would do that, that he would go into Jerusalem and that he would be crucified. In John chapter 2 verses 19 and 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. But he spake of the temple of his body. They thought he was talking about the, the temple that had been erected there. But they, he was talking about his body. He said, destroy this body, crucify me. And then after three days I will raise this body up again. That's exactly what he did. And John chapter 10 and verse 17, he said, I laid down my life that I might take it up again. And so he laid down his life and he took it up again. No man taketh my life, I lay it down, said the Son of God. And after three days and nights, I'll take it back up again. As far as the body is concerned, he did exactly that. Now you have other scriptures in the Old Testament, which is a type of the resurrection, which is brought out beautifully, uh, beautifully in the New Testament. Uh, for instance, the one about Jonah there, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. Now you know about the prophet Jonah. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I stood watched again that jopper while Jonah uh, was, while he left and of course got on the boat and, and then he was swallowed up by the whale. And that whale kept him on the inside of his body for three days and three nights. Then he regurgitated Jonah out upon dry ground and Jonah took off to Nineveh to do what God had called him to do. And he didn't like the Ninevites because they were Assyrians. And they'd cause Israel much heartache, and he and Kip, they all went to hell. But when God got through with him, he was glad to go to Nineveh and preach to them and tell them to repent, and that he did. You find also in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 22, a man by the name of Abraham had a son by the name of Isaac. And God said to Abraham, I want you to take your son Isaac on Mount Moriah, go up there on that mountain, and I want you to crucify, that is, rather put to death, your son Isaac. Abraham believed God. It wasn't easy for him to do that, but nevertheless he did. And he took Isaac and two servants 
and went to the foot of Mount Moriah where he left the two servants and they were a type of the two men that died on the cross by the side of Jesus. And then he put the wood on Isaac's back which is a type of Jesus carrying his cross and they went up to Mount Moriah on top of the hill where the Dome of the Rock is now there in Israel. And when they went up the top of that hill as they went up God was providing a way of escape that Isaac might not be put to death and a little ram was coming up no doubt on the other side and there they met on top of Mount Moriah and they uh, there prepared the altar in the form of a cross no doubt and there Isaac was placed on that altar and then Isaac said to his father Abraham he said father you have the fire and so forth and the wood and now how about the sacrifice how about the lamb and Abraham said, Son, God will provide himself a lamb. How true that was then as a type. How true that was in the New Testament when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. God provided himself. God himself became the lamb. God provided himself a lamb. And that lamb died on Calvary, was buried and rose again. And so there they placed Isaac on the altar. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 that Abraham believed God. And Abraham said, now God promised he had blessed my descendants through Isaac. And I believe if I put my boy to death, like God said put him to death, that God had raised him from the dead. He believed that with all of his heart. And so whenever he placed him on the altar, he knew God would to bring him back alive again. There if he put him to death. But when Abraham raised that knife to penetrate it into the heart of his son, God said, Abraham, Abraham, stay thy hand. There's a little ram caught by its horns over there in the thicket. Go over there and take that ram and bring it. And let Isaac off the altar and put that little ram on the altar. Now that little ram was caught by its horns. The reason it was caught by its horns is because had it been caught in those briars and vines by its leg or by its body or by its neck, it might have bruised itself trying to get away. And the Bible said that offering had to be without spot and without blemish. If that little ram had had a wound on its body, a sore on its body, a scratch on its body, it could not have taken the place of Isaac. But it did not have because it was caught by its horns in the thicket. Abraham goes over, he sees the little ram. He takes the vines around his little horns and he brings it out. And then he takes the blood and sheds that blood and places that on the altar there, which is the type of Jesus Christ, God's lamb. And he was without spot and without blemish. And so the little ram died in the place of Isaac. And Jesus Christ died in our place instead. Now let's move to thought number two. And that is the proof of the resurrection here. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. The Bible said he showed himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. Many infallible proofs. Proofs that could not be denied. And he showed himself alive. The son of God walking on the earth showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 6, the Bible said, He is not here, He is risen. There they saw the empty tomb. They knew that His body was placed there, but His body was not there anymore. That's an infallible proof that something had happened. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, the Bible said, Who was delivered for our offensive and raised again for our justification. And God said, Now, uh, when he went back to heaven that he would send the Holy Ghost and that he did on the day of Pentecost exactly like he said in the word of God. Number three, notice the purpose of the resurrection. I'll mention maybe uh, two or three uh, purposes for the resurrection. There's others. Number one, it was to prove his deity. When Jesus Christ came out of that grave, nobody could deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Nobody can deny the fact that he was very God and very man. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Declared that by the resurrection from the dead. There he proved his deity. 
Then secondly, to assure our justification. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, who was delivered by offensive and raised again for our justification. And when God saw his son raised from the dead, raised by the power of God, then that, of course, um, uh, secures our justification. God sees us in Christ as though we had never sinned. That means just as though I'd never sinned. In Romans chapter, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Therefore being justified by faith, so by faith in him, in his death, burial, and resurrection, we are justified. It's to guarantee a, a resurrection. There's to guarantee, a, first of all, a sure judgment. There's a sure judgment to come, and there's a, our own resurrection that's coming. If the ground could not hold the body of Jesus, neither would it hold the body of his church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against his church, and the bride-to-be is coming out of the grave, or will go out at the rapture part of it. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 31, because he's appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, thereof he's given assurance unto all men in that he's raised him from the dead. God gave assurance to all men in that he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That's coming a judgment day. We, we must face the judge. Notice thought number four. There's the power of his resurrection mentioned in the Bible. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. I don't need to elucidate upon that verse of Scripture. You can see what it's saying there. But notice Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. Thou may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. It speaks about the power of his resurrection. No wonder the devil hates the resurrection of the Son of God. Because the great power of God's involved here. And the devil hates that. If you read Matthew, or rather Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. It says, Now unto him that's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask and think according to the power that worketh in us. So we have the power of the resurrection in us as well. Now if Jesus had the power of the resurrection and no man taketh my life that I lay it down that I might take it up again and if he did that then we have the power of that resurrection living in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And if you have the power of the resurrection living in you you're coming out of that grave. Every saved person that goes to the graveyard will come out. There's no way, no way that old Mother Earth can hold that body forever because you have the power of the resurrection living in you. And when that holy dust, when the body is placed in the grave, the Holy Ghost watches over that holy dust. He knows where it is because the power of the resurrection was in that body and he'll come out of the grave when Jesus comes. Number five, you have the people of his resurrection mentioned in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. He said, Marvel at this, for the hour is coming to which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. Didn't say some of them, all of them. All in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life and they'd have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. Every man that's placed in the grave, whether saved or unsaved, is coming out. But they're not coming out at the same time. The Bible tells us, the first Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, that Jesus is coming back with a great shout, the voice of archangels, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The Bible tells us. Then, of course, we which are alive and remain shall be called to Meet, we meet them in the air, so shall ever be with the Lord, or meet him in the air, go along with our loved ones. Now, when Jesus comes, the next appearing of the Son of God, every saved person that's died is coming out of that grave. Every person that was indwelt by the Holy Spirit is coming out of that grave. I don't care where that body is, it's coming out. And God will bring it out, and that's part of the first resurrection. But wait a minute, there's another resurrection that he tells us about here. They that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. 
Now you're going to find that in Revelation chapter 20. You'll find there, there'll be a group of people that will stand at the great white throne judgment of God and they'll be judged. Who are they? They're the sinners that die without God. Now when Jesus comes at the resurrection or rapture, not one sinner will come out of the grave. Those bodies will remain there at least another thousand years. But at the end of that thousand year period, they will come out and they will stand before God and they will be judged. And so this verse tells us they're coming out, both the just and the unjust, but not at the same time. Many years ago, preachers preached a general resurrection. Still today, some of the uh, preachers will go to the grave and I've been there with them. And they'll take the little minister's star or whatever book they bought at the bookstore. And they'll start reading about one great general resurrection. Not a word of that truth. Beloved, you need to throw a book like that away and take the word of God. There's no such thing as a general resurrection. There's a resurrection for the just, that is the justified. And a resurrection for the unjust, though it's never been justified. And there's about a thousand year period between the two. And that you need to realize. Although it's not coming out together. The sinners will remain there for another thousand years. And then they will come out. And you must keep that in mind. Then we move to another thought. And that is the part of God's saving gospel. That's involved in the matter of the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3. I delivered unto you first of all that which I have also received. How Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. If you want to see the gospel in a nutshell. Then you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. About the first four verses. And there God gives you the, the gospel in a nutshell as it were. You need to read that. It involves the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. A man can preach all day and cuss out everybody that's listening to him and still not preach the gospel. Beloved, the, the heart of the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We need to realize that. We need to preach the gospel as well as other things we need to preach and take a stand against. Preach the whole counsel of God, the entire word of God. Now in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 is a great and mighty and weighty verse of scripture. I want you to look at it. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. And shalt believe in thine heart. That God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. No man can be saved. Denying or not believing. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible is clear on that. You might not understand all you like to know about it. But you can't deny it. And refuse to believe it. Expect God to save you. He won't do it. You might be kind of ignorant pertaining to that resurrection. And not understand what you'd like to know about it. But you won't deny it. When God saved me. I didn't know the Old Testament from the New. I didn't know anything about the Bible. But somebody told me that Jesus loved me. Died for me. Was buried and rose again. And uh, I, I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God saved me, but I didn't know anything about the resurrection or anything else in the Bible. But I believe I never denied it. I believed it. And you must believe it if you're going to be saved. If you don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you're going straight to hell as you can go. Because no man can go to heaven denying the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then we move to one other thought, and that is the physical reality of the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 5 and 6, the Bible said he was seen of Cephas, that is of Simon Peter. You know, Simon Peter denied him there whenever they tried him, and, and he had a broken heart and a bleeding heart, and he wept bitterly about it. And Jesus loved him, of course, and Jesus paid him a special visit after his resurrection and that comforted the heart of his servant, his apostle, and then the Bible said he appeared unto Simon, unto Cephas rather, and then he went to the twelve, and that, after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once. Five hundred brethren at once saw Jesus in his glorified body after his resurrection. Now I want you to get this. 
no sinner, no lost person ever laid eyes on the Son of God after his resurrection. The last time this ungodly evil world ever saw the Savior was when he was hanging on a cross. They didn't see him after his resurrection. But if they die in their sins, they'll see him at the judgment in Revelation chapter 20. But those that believed in him and believed in his resurrection, they're the ones that saw him after his resurrection, not the unsaved. They hissed, they mocked, they scoffed, they ridiculed, they put him to death with glee in their hearts. But that's the last time they saw him. They'll see him at the judgment. You need to realize that when the judge had died without God and dropped into hell, They'll stand before the Savior at the great white throne judgment of God. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, the Bible said we should be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You may say, preacher, what are we going to look like when we get over there? We're going to be like him. We're going to see him as he is and be like him, the Bible tells us. We'll have a glorified body like unto his. We'll have a body of eternal youth. See, Jesus died at about the age of 33. And we'll have a young body, a glorified body, a body that'll never grow old, a body that'll never have sickness or death come its way anymore, or pain or whatnot, when we see Jesus. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 21, it said, Who shall change our vile bodies, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. See, Jesus is going to change these vile bodies, that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious glorious body some of you sitting out there you have pains and aches in your body I saw a preacher friend of mine up in Reedsville last week and uh, he said that his wife has to help him up off the bed many times because of arthritis in his body he can't get up on his feet he said when he gets on his feet he can walk but he's suffering so with arthritis and there's some of you sitting out there you're suffering in body and this old pollen that's blowing around and blowing up your nose and down your throat and giving a lot of your fits just keeps you warping your nose and you got your nose red as a beet almost because of that pollen. Uh, but you know, when you get to heaven, you won't have to face anything like that. All the discomfort and all the pests and all the things that hurt and hinder you down here, you'll not face it when you get your glorified body. Be no pains. No heartaches, no headaches, no toothaches, nothing to harm your body or cause you to suffer. You need to remember that. And bear with me as I give this illustration because it's so fitting, and some of you have heard me give it before. There's a man one time looking for a friend that lived uh, down the way and lived in a big new match, white mansion down the way, and he was going down uh, this crooked road, dusty road, narrow, crooked gullies and uh, rocks and whatnot and he came up uh, down that road and he couldn't find this individual and he saw a man standing beside the road he said sir can you tell me where mr so-and-so resides he said uh, yes sir, i sure can he said sir i'll tell you you continue on down this crooked dusty road until you come to a cemetery and said when you arrive at that cemetery you go through the cemetery and beyond that cemetery there's a beautiful white mansion. So that's why you find the party you're looking for. That man thought for just a moment. He said, you know, that's the way life is. We're traveling down a rough road, many of us. Many of us having heartaches and pains. And many of us facing difficulty and battles and misunderstanding. And we are going down that crooked, rough road. And some of us are going through that cemetery. Now, whether you like it or not, if the rapture don't take place, uh, soon some of us are going through that cemetery. But beyond that cemetery, there's a beautiful home on heaven's shore. The Bible said in my father's house are many mansions. A beautiful resting place, a home over there beyond the cemetery. And when you pass through the cemetery, beloved, that body will be glorified. And then later, whenever it's glorified, you're going to move into the great heavens and later into the great city of God. Isn't that wonderful? Aren't you glad you're saved today? I'm glad Jesus came out of that grave. Uh, they couldn't keep him there. And God said the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. And I'm glad we have that promise of the word of God. I'm glad we have the promise that the earth cannot forever hold our bodies 
It must give it up. Earth must give up your body sooner or later if you go before the rapture. Thank you so kindly. You listen well. I want you to stand to your feet. Stand to your feet and bow your heads for just a moment. Do we have one here today who will say, Preacher Edwards, I'm not saved. If I should go today, I wouldn't be ready to meet God, but I'm honest. I don't want to go to hell. I'd like to be saved. I want you to pray for me. Would you slip that hand up and hold it up till I see it and take it back down? I'm not trying to trap you or embarrass you. I want to pray for God. Bless this the girl. Yeah, I see a hand. God bless you. Someone else, you may want to uh, be saved today and you might want to join the church, be baptized tonight with others that will be baptized. Anyone else, while I wait just a moment, would you hold that hand up and say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm not saved. Would you raise that hand up right now while I wait just a moment? Anywhere? Any place? Do we have one today say, Preacher Edwards, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I once knew God, but I backslid on the Lord, broke that fellowship. I'm not happy. I want you to pray for me. Will you slip that hand up? Say, Preacher, pray for me. I, I'm out of fellowship with God. Would you raise your hand anywhere in the audience before I pray? I'm going to pray in just a moment. How about it? Waiting just a moment. Any other? Any other? I'll tell you, if you're not right with God, you need to get saved. People dying every day. People going to hell every day. You need to get right with God. Father, I pray for this precious young girl that, that raised her hand wanting to be saved. Help her realize that this very moment, this day, is the time she needs to get saved. I pray for others here in this building that might not be saved. Help them to know that they can't go to heaven unless they are. And they have no promise of tomorrow. They could be in hell tomorrow at this time. I hope not. But we don't know. Father, help us today in the invitation. May Jesus be glorified. Amen.